Words to which I'd like to direct your attention this morning, found in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me, for the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you use your word to strengthen our faith as we pass through this world. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Proud logic suggests that anyone not ministering in my circle must be lacking. And in this passage, we see that John is filled with proud logic. You will recall that earlier in this chapter, in Mark chapter 9, verse 34, just a few verses before this, the disciples were arguing. They were disputing with one another about who was the greatest. And in response, Jesus gets a little child, sets him in their midst, takes him in his arms, and then says in verse 37, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, which gets John's wheels turning. Really, John is thinking, whoever, even those who aren't traveling with us right now, whoever receives one such child in Christ's name receives Christ. And so John then says in verse 38, well, teacher, We saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. So realize what's going on here. John is proposing this scenario to Jesus to test drive what Jesus said in verse 37. Jesus said, whoever. And John's thinking, whoever, really, because there's people out there who aren't in our circle. And so John is testing Jesus here. And he's saying, okay, whoever, should we even receive this guy that we saw who's appropriating your name? We don't even know who he is, but he's using your name to cast out demons. You know, we told him to stop, you know, because he's not one of us. He doesn't travel with us. Did we do well, Jesus? You see, John seems proud of the fact that the disciples forbid someone outside their circle from driving out demons. And in response, Jesus says, Do not stop him. And then Jesus gives three reasons why. Reason number one, verse 39, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Reason number two, verse 40, for the one who is not against us is for us. And then reason number three, verse 41, for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So in the course of Jesus' three reasons, he answers a couple of really important questions that are still relevant for God's people today. He answers the question first, who are our friends? And he answers the second question, what is important work? And so let's consider these two questions. First, Who are our friends? That is, in in, in context of ministry relationships, who are our friends? Who are our allies? Who should we partner with? Who should we approve of? Who should we be seen with? Who are our friends in terms of doing ministry? Look with me again at verse 38. This is John's objection, John's, uh, John's words to Jesus. John said, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. So first understand what's going on here. And what does this mean, he's not following us? Well, this person that they saw has no outward connection to the disciples. They do not labor together. 
They're not actively involved in each other's ministry. They don't travel in the same circles. And so think about this. Apparently, in the course of Jesus' ministry, as people listened to his teaching, as people received his healing, pockets of followers sprouted up. And apparently, some even had the power to cast out demons. And apparently, these other groups were unknown to the disciples. Until one day, John sees someone casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And so, what's going on here? So, there's multiple groups of Jesus followers operating in Judah. They cannot all act in coordination with one another. They cannot all act in subordination to one another. And what we learn in this passage is, that's okay. This passage is teaching us about identifying sides. This is essential to gospel ministry. We must identify sides. Who's on whose side? How do we know who are our friends? And how do we know who are false friends? How do we know who's an ally in ministry? And how do we know who's a saboteur? And here we learn it's not a simple question. It's not black and white. Scripture elsewhere confirms the complexity of this question. Consider Abner. Abner was an honorable man, but an enemy of David. Joab was a dishonorable man, but on David's side. This is a difficult question. Who are our friends in ministry? Who are our allies? It's not always easy to know. And yet the question seems oddly relevant in our tumultuous times. Today, there are many different churches, many different ministers, many different para-church organizations carried off in different directions doing ministry of all different sorts. Many groups are out in different parts of the harvest without direct connection to each other, without direct knowledge of each other. And Jesus says in verse 40, for the one who is not against us is for us. And I think it's important that we as Trinity Reformed Church receive the words of Jesus this morning. So listen carefully. Who's on whose side? Who's our allies? Jesus says, the one who is not against us is for us. Now, what does this mean? <clears throat> well, there are many different churches out there doing ministry different from us. There are churches out there that look different than ours. Their services on Sunday morning look different than ours. Their distinctives look different than ours. Their emphasis looks different than ours. Their gifts look different than ours. What should we do about it? Well, we have to embrace the fact that, yes, they may look different than us, but that doesn't mean they're not on Christ's team, too. What are we supposed to do about it? There's all these different groups out there doing ministry in the name of Jesus, and they do it differently than us. They look different than us. They sing different songs than us. They read different books than us. They go to different conferences than us. What should we do about this problem? Well, we have to recognize that it's okay. That's okay. It's not necessary for every group to do things identical. It's not necessary to do everything the same, for us all to read the same books, to listen to the same podcast, to have the same people we look up to. That's okay if we do things differently. But I want you to notice the tendency here, especially seen in John in verse 38. Notice the tendency in Christians. The tendency is to see other Christian groups, to even see them doing faithful work, such as casting out demons in Jesus' name. And the tendency is to say, but wait, 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 he's not following us. He's not one of us. I mean, wait, how could he possibly be doing faithful ministry? He hasn't read these books here that I think are really important. How could he possibly be doing faithful ministry? Wait, 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 he's not listened to the podcast in my podcatcher. How could he possibly be doing faithful ministry? He doesn't know all these things that are essential, that I've said are essential. How could they possibly be honoring the Lord in their ministry? You have to, that's the tendency of Christians. 
We've got our circle we do ministry in. There's lots of other Christians out there doing ministry. You say, oh, they're doing it different. They're reading different books. They're going to different conferences. They're listening to different podcasts. How could they possibly be faithful Christians too? That's the tendency that's within all of us as Christians. So back to our question. How do we know who are our friends in ministry? How do we know who are our allies? In other words, by what standard do we identify who are our allies? By what standard do we identify who are our friends and who are false friends? Consider two guidelines. First, how do we know who are our friends? Well, first realize it's not about appearances. It's not about mere appearances. Because understand that when modern Christians are, are, are wrestling with this question, when modern Christians are trying to determine friend or foe, we make judgments based on superficial appearances. And basically, we make judgments like we're a PR firm for some corporation. And so when we start thinking about this question as Christians, basically we say, well, you know, I kind of like that ministry and what's going on over there. I kind of like that pastor. I kind of like that church. But, you know, if we're seen associating with them, if we're seen associating with that pastor, if we're seen associating with that ministry, well, you know, that's going to make us look bad because a lot of people don't like them. A lot of people slander them. And so if we're seen, you know, publicly acknowledging them or doing ministry with them or forming alliances with them, then those people that slander them, they're going to slander us. See, that's how we run the calculation as modern Christians. We're moderns. We're basically full-time PR firms here when we think about these sorts of things. But realize we're not called to make alliances based on mere appearances. If deciding friend or foe was based on appearances, then Barnabas would never have taken Paul to the apostles and vouched for him in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, in the case of Jesus, in John chapter 7, they come after Jesus and they're slandering him. And Jesus says this in John chapter 7, verse 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And so we know that identifying friend or foe is not based on appearances. And so, rather than judge by appearances, Jesus says, judge with right judgment. So think about what that means. Judge with right judgment. First off, you're supposed to judge. Jesus said it, judge with right judgment. So, when you're trying to figure out friend or foe, when you're trying to determine who's your friend in ministry, judge. Let's start there. We need to judge. So, judge, and then judge rightly. So, we are supposed to judge. We're supposed to assess. We're supposed to make a decision. But how are we supposed to do that? If not by appearances. And so, how do we know who are our friends? The first guideline is, it's not about appearances. And the second guideline is it's about sincere devotion to the Jesus of the Bible. And this is what Jesus is getting at in verse 39. Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. In other words, what Jesus is saying here, and I realize this is hard for us to accept, we're very cynical people, but what Jesus is saying here is the fact that this man is able to work miracles in Jesus' name shows that he's not an enemy. The man is associating himself with Jesus by using his name. He's casting out demons in the name of Jesus, so he's publicly associating himself with Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus is basically saying, this puts him on the right side. And Jesus is saying, such a person cannot consistently go on to speak as Jesus' enemy. And so there's no justification for John and the disciples to oppose this person. But remember, this isn't easy. This, this is not simple. It's, it's not always black and white. So consider what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. In other words, a Christian will not curse Jesus. A Christian 
declares and submits to the lordship of Christ. And so Jesus is Lord can only be uttered with full meaning under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And saying Jesus is accursed can only be uttered with full meaning, with the absence of the Holy Spirit. John also said something like this in 1 John 4, 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And so, tying this all in then with verse 39 in Mark chapter 9, it all starts with their devotion to Christ. Jesus said, verse 39, consider it again. Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. And so that means that those who minister in Jesus' name with sincerity are friends. And I emphasize with sincerity for the same reason that some of you are wondering, but what about those people who use the name of Jesus but then deny the Jesus of the Bible? Well, yes, that's a real problem. And in fact, we see that situation in Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. The Jewish exorcists started using the name of Jesus in their work. And their practice is condemned. Why? Because they had no actual allegiance to Jesus. They had no actual belief in Jesus. They did not sincerely use the name of Jesus in their work. They were not genuine in their belief in Jesus. They just used his name, like someone might use a magic incantation. And so, how do we know who are our friends? By what standard do we identify who are friends, who are false friends? Well, we've got two guidelines. First, it's not about appearances. Second, it is about sincere devotion to Christ. Those who serve the Lord with sincerity those who acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Those who acknowledge that Jesus is God, 1 John 4, 2 and 3. Those who are serving in the name of Jesus, Mark chapter 9, verse 39. Those are the people that we should recognize as allies, as ministry allies. John's problem is that he is looking for whether or not they have membership in his circle. You know, he's worried about, do they know our secret handshake? But in practice, this passage is teaching us that sincere believers in the Lord who make the Orthodox confession, they are to be considered on the same team. Whenever there are genuine and sincere signs of faithfulness, Jesus is teaching us here that we must presume that the gospel is at work. It is our duty to love Christians everywhere even if they don't agree with us on every point, even if their ministry looks different from ours. Now, this doesn't mean we have to have the same degree of cooperation or friendship with everyone who sincerely does ministry in the name of Christ, but it does mean that we are part of the universal church. We are not a sect. And so the first question this passage answers is who are our friends. The second passage this question answers is, what is important work? What is important work? So look with me at verse 41. Jesus says, for truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So verse 41 is saying that every cup of cold water given to those who belong to Christ will be revealed in the last day and will be rewarded. Now think about this, because a gift of water in, 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 in the ancient world, that's a basic feature of ancient hospitality. I mean, that's just assumed. Like, of course you give someone a cup of water. This is no big deal. This is the most ordinary, routine thing you could do for someone in the ancient world, in ancient hospitality. No one 
in that first century world would think that this deserves a reward. No, this is just assumed. This is just what you do. This is so simple and ordinary. No one would think that this should be rewarded. Yet Christ here says, no, even the most assumed act of charity will be noticed by your heavenly Father, and it will be rewarded. And so realize what this is saying. Even the smallest acts of hospitality and service given to Jesus' followers will not go unnoticed by your heavenly Father. It may go unnoticed by other people, but it will not go unnoticed by your heavenly Father. And this should provide encouragement to you to make small acts of kindness, small acts of service and hospitality to your brothers and sisters in Christ a priority. God sees all of it, and God remembers and, it says here, rewards that life of faithfulness. You see, we often use the, the doctrine of God's omniscience as a deterrent against sin. You know, and we say, you know, God's watching, so don't sin. You might think no one else sees it. You might think you're getting away with it, but you're not getting away with it because God sees everything, therefore don't sin. <clears throat> and of course, using the doctrine of God's omniscience in that application is perfectly acceptable. But Mark chapter 9, verse 41 teaches us that we should also use the doctrine of God's omniscience as an encouragement for faithfulness. In other words, we should also be saying to one another, you know, God's watching. God sees everything. So even if no one else knows about this small act of kindness, God knows, God sees it, and God will reward you. And realize that the reward that's mentioned in verse 41, the reward of God is not like, you know, a pat on the head where God's saying, oh, how cute, you did this cute little deed, no one was looking, good for you. No, that's not, that's not the reward here. It's not like that. I mean, you, you, you'll discover that the reward, yes, it, part of that reward is the Father's approval, and that's, that's, that's important. Yes, that's part of it. But you will also see, as part of your reward, you will see in God's perfect plan how he worked through every humble deed. You will see, as part of your reward, something far greater than you could ever have imagined could be accomplished through your modest, ordinary, simple, overlooked, forgotten acts of daily faithfulness. And notice one more thing in verse 41. He says, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. And so verse 41 is talking about serving those who specifically belong to Jesus. And so Jesus is not calling us to you know, just mere benevolence. Jesus is not calling us to random acts of kindness with strangers. Here, Jesus is calling us to serve fellow Christians through practical help. And again, notice verse 41. What does Jesus take as evidence of faithfulness? Well, it's a simple, ordinary act of giving someone water. The most ordinary, common thing in the ancient world. You know, the radical things we humans tend to praise and celebrate are not always the things that God praises and celebrates. And Jesus makes this very point to the Pharisees in Luke chapter 16, verse 15, when he says, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You see, the ordinary things that people think are insignificant, the ordinary things that we think are insignificant and trivial, turn out to be the things that God is using to build his kingdom. And also remember that Jesus is holding a baby when he says this. Like this is connected back to verses 34 through 37. Jesus still has the baby in his arms when he says this. Surely that shapes the application of what Jesus means in verse 41. How many cups of water has the, has the mother of four given to her children? Because they belong to her and therefore they belong to Christ. Well, too many to count. Too many to remember. By the time the kids are grown, the parents will have completely forgotten about each cup of water they serve to their thirsty covenant children. 
And I hope you're starting to realize that the cup of water just represents a thousand everyday, simple, overlooked, forgotten winks of faithfulness. Like a word of encouragement or a patient response or a warm smile or a prayer when someone asks for it, a meal for a family with a newborn baby, a supportive text message, a listening ear when someone needs to talk it through, when you hold your tongue or not taking offense. You see, the one who performs such small daily good deeds, you know, these are usually forgotten. A week after the fact, you've forgotten you even did any of these things. They're so common, they're so ordinary, and they're so frequent in the life of a faithful Christian. But here's the point. You might have forgotten that you've even done those things one week later. God has not forgotten a one of them. And more than that, these are the things he is using to build his kingdom. And, according to verse 41, these are the things you're going to be rewarded for. See, the principle is this. Insignificant actions in this life are far more significant than you think. You see, the commands of Christ are not just a list of things to test your faith. Obedience to Jesus' commands is how God builds his kingdom. And that's why in church history, the more the church is obedient to God's word, the more it grows. And for some reason, that hasn't made it into the church planting brochure. But that's what really matters among a local church. And so, in conclusion, what have we seen? Well, the disciples want to stop a man who's casting out demons in Jesus' name. And Jesus gives them three reasons to not stop him. And in the course of his reasoning, Jesus answers two important questions. Who are our friends? And what is important work? You see, this passage illustrates, as we see in verse 40, that the one not against us is for us. In other words, folks are either on God's side or they're not. There's no middle side. There's no neutral side. And as we see in Numbers chapter 11, verses 26 through 29, how Joshua, when he was Moses' assistant, he attempts to restrain Eldad and Medad from prophesying. And Moses tells him, were that all that the Lord's people were prophets. Were that all the Lord's people were prophets. You see, that needs to be our response when we see different Christian groups doing faithful ministry. And so may this be our response when we see other Christians doing faithful ministry, whether it's something big and noticeable or whether it's some small forgotten act of kindness. May we look upon those Christians, even if they run in different circles, and should we say, may we say, if only all God's people were doing faithful ministry like that. In other words, may we see each other as allies of significant work rather than enemies.